This <laughs> Welcome to the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women's Lunch and Learn. And we're going to learn today from our legislative representatives and senators. Thank you so much for being here today. I am Debbie Hope Downey. I'm past president of OFDW. And we're so delighted to have with us this afternoon, Representative Trish Ranson. And she is from House District 34, which is Stillwater, Payne County. Yes, have, go folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, they were at the Capitol this week. <laughs> so lots of things going on. Uh, and we're also delighted to have Senator Julia Kurt from Oklahoma County in that Senate District um, 30. And also, we're glad to have a wonderful ally with us, Senator Reverend George Young. <laughs> too many titles. I, I gave you two. <laughs> and he is from Oklahoma City also, Oklahoma County. I looked at your district. It, it's... Uh, quite different because <laughs> I must take admin. So, but we're so glad to have you all today. Uh, we have one other uh, representative and hopefully she will be joining us soon. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, one of the big topics every year is education. So I would like to start with Representative Ranson, a former educator, and uh, she it's very involved with the, the Education Caucus. So, Representative Ranson, would you give us an update about the education issues? Absolutely. Um, so, education, what we're seeing overall is the, um, the status that we're in right now is, okay, what is it that we value in education and what is it that we are willing to pay for it? And so, in that idea, there's been several ideas as far as, well, Let's take our money that we apportion to education and let's let's break it up and make vouchers out of it so that parents can be more involved and in charge of their students' taxpayer dollars for education. Um, that bill uh, got killed in the Senate, but I don't, I'm a little leery to, to say that it is officially dead. Um, the, uh, the pro tem has said that, you know, that is his priority and whether that comes back in a shucked bill or whether that comes back in negotiations, I still feel like there is something that could happen with that. But we're also looking at, you know, a lot of the hot topic buttons of, you know, uh, book banning, library restrictions, that type of thing. Um, how do we make sure that our teachers are paid to their to their worth? Because we want to we want to recruit, we want to retain all of that. So there are a lot of ideas about there, but then it goes back to what are we willing to pay for it? And right now I'm, I'm a little leery at saying that we're willing to put any extra money into uh, funding these things. Uh, we've seen with the idea of a six figure pay for teachers that uh, let's use the lottery funds for that. Well, lottery funds already go to education. So it's like, it's just like, oh, we'll just shuffle this money over to help with those, those, those uh, paychecks. But we're not really willing to put more money into the pot for that. Also, as far as like, let's incentivize higher ed and say, okay, we need more engineers, we need more teachers, we need more nurses. Um, let's incentivize higher ed to graduate more, more students. Well, higher ed, I mean, that is how they make their money is to graduate students. So um, <laughs> it's, it's like, are, are we gonna put more money forward and, and into higher ed? And that's something that we need to be looking at because if our future jobs are we going to require at least two years post-secondary education, we've got to invest in that because otherwise we're not putting the money into our education system to produce citizens with the amount of education that they're going to need for these jobs in the future. So right now, it's just a big overall picture. Um, and, you know, we're always wondering uh, what that, that the budget numbers are going to be when it's finally hashed out. But I'm not hearing a lot of talk of putting more money into the funding formula for Common Ed. I'm not hearing much talk about putting more money towards higher ed and career tech. And that is very alarming. Would you be okay if I jump in there, Debbie? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, I just want to add, um, I mean, first on the budget. So 
there's a lot of talk about being cautious and about flat budgets. Um, we're looking at ending this fiscal year, which ends at the end of June, with a $1.2 billion surplus. So that means we, the estimates that were made for this year were, were made pretty low because we really didn't know what was going to happen with the economy. Um, and revenues have come in a lot higher between federal uh, relief money and other things in our economy. We've had a lot more money come in. So $1.2 billion will be left over at the end of this year. And next year, they're projecting uh, about $600 million increase in our revenues. And while I certainly don't want us um, going crazy and spending money that that we're not going to have in the future, I think we have to be realistic that a flat budget is a cut. And so if we keep education budgets flat, that truly is a cut because we all know um, and our all of our colleagues are now embracing that inflation does exist and that it does cost more um, every year to do business. Um, realistically, if we keep education budgets flat, they will be losing money and they won't have as much to spend. And we certainly won't be seeing the increases we need in terms of resources for kids and solid salaries for teachers. I'll say last week in appropriations, we saw a bill specifically that's a great bill for giving scholarships to education students, students who are studying education in higher ed, um, also include a signing bonus. I love it, but I got to say, um, the, even the author himself talked about two different previous efforts at encouraging educators um, that were made and then not funded. And so as uh, Representative Ranson says, the money, show us the money, make sure that that money is going to back it up. Um, we have one time monies at a very high level that we could be using. And we also need to make the long term commitment to reach or exceed the regional average for spending on kids. The other thing I want to say is just I'm a public school parent. My kids are in Oklahoma City public schools. There's been a lot of representing public school parents and parents of young children in a certain way. Um, and I think others, people need to speak up and make sure uh, everyone knows that those voices don't represent them. So I know that many of my fellow public school parents do not at all feel represented by the idea of parent choice that's being presented. Um, we've chosen to send our kids to our community schools and we want resources for every kid's community school. We don't want there to be schools that are getting more and attracting students and taking students out of districts. We want to support schools so that every neighborhood has that level of quality. And um, we've seen lots of ways to, to chip away at that, including um, allowing transportation across school district lines and other things that could really lead to schools choosing their kids. Um, and I know that that's not the best thing for all kids in our in our state. So those are a couple of things I just wanted to mention. I think people who love public schools and believe in public schools need to speak up now about the urgency of funding, because I think there's a sense that we're going back to normal somehow. But we know if any of us are paying attention, we know how much schools have faced over the last couple of years and that they were already um, significantly below regional averages funding wise. Um, and we haven't added the supports that are needed for kids that we know they need for their mental health and for their ongoing well-being. Um, so anyway, just make sure people know that you understand how urgent it is. Thank you. Isn't there going to be a big rally at the Capitol on Wednesday with the parents coming supporting education? You know, the parent legislative action committees have been wonderful. I think that's one of the greatest things that's happened since the teacher walkout was the parents finally getting more organized to speak up for the schools. Um, you know, we put so much on teachers. We even put the advocacy for the schools on teachers. Um, I think parents have finally realized that and community members that if they don't speak up, that that people aren't going to hear. And so the PLAC parent legislative action committee has been organizing capital events. And, yeah, they have one uh, Wednesday morning uh, that anyone's welcome at. Right. Good. Um, Senator Young, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, I, I agree with all that's been said and a couple other things, and particularly and specifically for my particular district. I, I'm very concerned about uh, the conversations that have been had, particularly around the idea of uh, vouchers and the empowerment account and all of that. And, and you saw where the rural legislators joined in with uh, progressive legislators to uh, defeat uh, uh, the, the bill that was on the floor, uh, the midnight movement that took place and did not work. Um, but it's important because as you talk about the problems in education from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, Trish and Julia, I heard both of those. When you talk about it from Northeast Oklahoma City, there is a whole nother level, a whole nother depth 
of, of problematic things that have occurred. And the more it's, it's only one pot. There's only one pot of money. You can describe it any way you want to. There's only one pot. And as you take money out of that pot and place it uh, in the hands of people to leave public education, you then hinder and hurt the progress of those schools that have been the backbone of who we are as a nation today. And I'll quickly add one of the things is that in the last uh we, we lost two or three years it's going to be it's going to be difficult for teachers to come to to try and overcome what covid has caused that's a whole nother problem on top of uh the whole education problem then no one mentioned this but i, I said this i'm concerned particularly again about for my district because it's a heavily minority district heavily african-american i represent more african-americans than any other legislator you know when they brought up the whole thing of crt i thought they were talking about the cathode ray tube i didn't know they were talking about <laughs> some graduate some graduate policy uh that that is discussed in graduate school as a as a way of helping people to understand that has no place in this discussion in public education and for them to use that as a as a camouflage as a way of being able to uh, hide what they were really trying to get at and that is to not rewrite because you can't rewrite history but tell history in a way that is more pleasant and more meaningful to those who seem to think that history does not reflect well upon them history is history and it has brought us to where we are and the very problems we're talking about in education uh you can find them you can find them with the root of those problems uh based in our particular history of of the united states of america today and so i think that's a consideration when we start talking about someone mentioned burning of books in libraries all of that is part of this discussion that we need to talk about in education it's not only financing it's not only money but it's also how we go about the process that has served us well and if we if we turn around they've been taking money out of education for years and if we put that money back and put additional funding in we will see the difference that will be made it's not all money but a whole a lot of it has to do with how much we have decimated uh, education in this state over the last few years thank you uh representative um Melanie Blancet has joined us thank you Melanie for being here uh, she's from House District 78, and that's the Tulsa area. So uh, how is education, how's all these bills affecting Tulsa area? Well, I mean, um, in terms of, are you talking specifically about education? Yes, right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I think that the additional concern that we have echoes what um, Senator Young and Representative Ranson and Senator Kirk had indicated that um, even though the narrative in the majority caucus is that, um, and I'm going to reference the loft uh, committee report on the funding of uh, teacher salaries. Um, this was about a month ago where they manipulated kind of the numbers and and uh, incorporated in that a calculation of the cost of living in Oklahoma to adjust the overall compensation for teachers to make it appear as though teachers were higher paid in the region than than other states, which is completely false. And so I think the you know, the concern that Tulsa has um, goes with what our my co colleagues here have said, that the narrative out there with the majority party that we are we are well funding education, that they're, you know, that we're top in the region in terms of teacher pay. It's just not true. And the behavior that we saw this last week, well, not this week, but the week before that, when it was deadline week, and trying to get the um, you know the uh, the voucher bill pushed through the Senate, I mean Senator Kirk can attest and Senator Young that the governor personally was walking the halls of the Senate, twisting arms and getting in people's faces. They kept the vote open for over an hour, didn't they, senators? I mean it was ridiculous. 
too. Yes. And so regardless of what the facts say, and we know the facts say that we have cut public education more than anyone else, even the new chancellor, Alison Garrett said as much in a recent uh, speech she gave in Tulsa, even with the facts, they are maintaining that education is um, funded just fine. Thank you. And we know that's not true. So what's when Senator Kurt says we need public education advocates to speak out now and loudly, then that's what I'm hearing in my district. Great, great. Um, also, what about UCO? They're cutting, are potentially cutting 40 faculty. Are you hearing this from other universities also? I'm, I'm currently not hearing that from OSU right now, but um, it is a concern because if programs are dwindling in as far as uh, enrollment, then you're going to the, the those departments are going to have to cut back. But the, the real trick with cutting faculty at the secondary or the higher ed level is that accreditation depends on a faculty student ratio. If there is not that faculty student ratio, then that college can get into accreditation issues. Um, this had happened several years past at OSU with their veterinarian school and the program. And there was a faculty to student ratio that was not up to where it needed to be. And OSU needed to make changes to make sure that that accreditation stayed intact, which they did, which was all very good because the vet school is one of the top vet schools in the nation to actually lose accreditation for, for that department would have been devastating for OSU. So, there are real big issues of, okay, do we have enough students enrolled? Do we have that that establishes the need for the faculty? But if if there are cuts having to be made across the, the campus because of appropriations not matching the need, then that is a real, real danger and a real threat. Yeah, I'll just say that, I mean, we had the biggest cuts to higher ed in the country. They cut got cut more than 30%. Um, right about what, five years ago, mm -hmm. um, maybe six. And so now when there's increases, like last year, they got what, a 3% increase. Um, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back, but they're right. not even rebuilt to where they were 20 years ago. So the right. state is providing a smaller and smaller percentage of the cost of the education, which means it's less affordable for students. Yeah. Um, the universities are having to make up for um, lack of, of appropriations by charging more in fees. And that's a hardship for those students and it, and it really limits who can participate. I know that UCOs faced a wide variety of pressures simultaneously, one being um, a lot more students starting in community college and more affordable colleges and then um, transferring in. And so that's changed UCOs student makeup a lot. Some of those things have been encouraged by the legislature, but I think that they're made even more problematic that we're not giving consistent support to higher ed and then you've got this huge disruption of COVID. And yeah. I mean, really, we don't know yet what the full impact is going to be that infected students being able to choose to go to college. A lot of students dropped out. Um, and I see our role in the legislature is helping higher ed and common ed weather this um, with the resources they need. I see something like what UCO is having to do. And to me, this is not the right time for making these kind of cuts. Um, students need more help, not less. And so I'm concerned that we're not viewing this as an urgent problem. Higher ed already is underfunded. And then, you know, on top of that, we're expecting more of them in terms of mental health resources, student services, remediation. I mean, we, we understand that higher ed is having to do a lot more helping students be prepared for college level coursework. And you wouldn't believe the student support expectations now. I have an intern right now who helps me be more aware. She's a mentor for first generation college students. We need more Oklahomans having the opportunity to go to college. And there are unique needs for first generation students. Um, they don't like she said, her, her students she works with don't even know what to ask for and that she didn't know how to ask for help herself, um, but that she's learned by being there and by having those resources available. They even have money coaches on campus to help students to learn how to uh, manage their money to handle the pressures. So 
we as the legislature should be investing in those kids and in those programs so that it's not such a hardship for families. Very good point. Can, can I just add, cause I'm a, I serve on the uh, President's Advisory Council out of UCO, and last month we had a presentation uh, that, in my eyes, was, was very devastating to see what was occurring. I mean, it was a very serious report on uh, the number of uh, faculty positions that they were looking at having to cut, and even some of the programs that they were having to cut, even though they're still, I, I thought the president presented a, a really good picture in, behind the information that she, they presented a very good picture of how they were fighting back and struggling to make sure that things continue at, at a certain level. I don't think they're in danger of going away, but I do think that they are in danger of being impacted in a negative way that it could, it could severely affect some of the more, I think, developing programs that they have at UCO. And uh, on the Langston campus, I, you know, the Langston, we have a campus in my district in Oklahoma City. And so I talked to Dr. Smith. I try to talk to him quite often about that. And uh, they're trying to hold on. Their enrollment was a little not as high as it has been over the last few years, in addition to that, trying to maintain the programs. But uh, interesting fact to me was that because uh, I interested in sports and so I played basketball in high school and college they didn't have a single this talks about the financial state of the school they didn't have a single basketball player that was on full scholarship this past year that that says something to me about the financial uh stability of that school that 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 they had to uh, not be able and, and I know the sports are not the main thing that people on campus but it does give you a barometer of what's happening across the campus and so I think that was significant and so I think we do have some problems that are not have not come to the top you know come to the surface in it when it comes to our universities and our colleges particularly those the regional ones and the smaller ones that are being impacted I think in a very 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 uh severe way OSU OU will be able to survive but 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 you you will start talking about survival of some of those campuses if something does not change in the near future. All right. Well, thank you so much for that information about UCO. Uh, also, uh, OCU cutting their education department. Uh, Senator Curtin, in that university in your district? Yes. It's very sad. All right. Let's. Um, move on to another topic that is very dear to us is voter registration and attacks on how how we vote uh senator young would you start us off on this conversation i can't start off nice with that so i don't know why you started with me there is no nice starting <laughs> there is no place to start that i'm going to be cordial about what in the heck are we doing passing legislation that has anything to do with forensic testing of, of our voting we had we had great shout out and, and we're worried about federal overreach into our voting system I, it is it is the most ludicrous thing that i've ever heard in my life but it is very serious i've laughing but it's very serious when you see what happened in, on the federal level with them not being able to uh, pass the voter right uh, bill that has been renewed over and over. it is this is a very very serious problem and and i think bigger than uh, i said bigger than the problem of not passing those and the, and the attacks that we're having on uh, the rights of citizens to vote which we ought to be opening up and trying to get more folk to vote but obviously that works against uh the other side of the aisle for us they want less folk to vote and i guess the less folk that vote the better they do they may have they may have something with that but it is the craziest thing in the world and and so i'm i'm, I'm really at a loss as to uh other than us trying to to promote uh, registration, then voting, and then encouraging folk to vote on those days to vote. I, I, I'm, I'm really at a loss because they are really attacking from a standpoint that any other time I would say would just be laughable, but it's not funny. It is impacting uh, not only in Oklahoma, just take Oklahoma for a moment and look at the bills that came through about voters, right? That was just craziness. But look at what's happening in the other states, Georgia and old uh, Arizona, all those other places where they're passing legislation to impact the ability of people to exercise their constitutional rights. And it is, this is a severe problem in our nation. And they cover it with this idea of a federal overreach that the states ought to control their voting. And obviously that didn't work before the Civil War. And obviously it's not going to work 
now letting states have have control we need federal overreach if that's what they want to call it to control some things and so now i i, I i'm trying to be nice i can't be nice about that it is a very severe problem and to see some of the bills of legislation in, in the Senate that we've had already, it's just heartbreaking to see what people are doing to try to prevent folk from being able to exercise their, their constitutional rights. Right. Okay. Uh, does anybody else want to chime in on this topic? Well, you know, I've had a couple of uh, meetings on campus at OSU about um, how to get involved and how to get your voice heard. And just the, the idea that, you know, college kids need to vote. <laughs> and um, the because it, it affects how candidates craft their message. It affects how, you know, um, how they cater to the population that's going to vote. Because right now, 65 and older is the population that votes every election all the time, you know. So um, and so the messages is get, catered to that age group because they're the ones that vote and just encouraging college students that you know, you spend nine months out of the year in Stillwater. This is your home. You should be registered to vote here because there's so much local that happens, state and local issues that you need to make sure that you're being a part of and you're getting your voice heard. But it is that kind of that disconnect of, well, you know, politics doesn't affect me. And I'm like, oh, yes, politics affects every single day of your life on campus. And so we need to make sure that we are being out there and 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 going to vote when we every time every time we can uh cinder kurt didn't you have a positive bill passed yeah i um I, i'm hesitant to even say it lest it die on the house side but um there's one very small change for fairness that i hope moves forward and even if it's not my bill uh hopefully it'll move forward in some vehicle which is that Right now, we have two types of absentee ballots, and you have to excuse the name. I did not name these ballots, but there's what they call the standard absentee ballot, and then there's the ballot for folks who claim incapacity, and that means a physical inability to vote at the polls or their caregivers. Right now, we have different rules for the return of those ballots, so the folks who have the incapacitated ballots cannot hand deliver their ballot, which is just completely unfair. And especially with the mail system as it is, you know, there's been a lot more concern about whether your ballot's arriving. So um, it would just make it fair. So your return method, you could return it to the county election board with an ID. It's all safe and secure. The only people who voted against it are people who don't like absentee ballots at all. Right. And there's a general paranoia about that. Um, so I hope that moves forward. I'd say at the same time, I saw five or six pretty bad um, election-related bills in the last week. Frankly, we haven't seen some of the ones I would consider the most damaging from the House yet, so I'm knocking on wood that they're being filtered out. But um, we saw bills that would change the state questions um, structure. We did not see the worst of those. We saw one that would change constitutional um, changes to have to have 55% to pass them. And I made fun of the author that we were that that might pass with 54 percent and then it'll just show how ridiculous it is. But um, we also are seeing things to tighten up and watch out for security risks in the absentee ballot process. And I and I literally had someone tell me that getting something notarized is no big deal. Um, and for those of you who've helped people vote or talk to people regularly, you know how big a challenge it is to get something notarized if you're not. Number one, driving. Number two, out at banks and other places like that with regularity, you're not around notaries all the time. And so I think there's a mindset that that it's OK to make people jump through hurdles to participate. And so they want to add more verification processes into the system. And it's I mean, it's ridiculous. And I was trying to point out that just every barrier you lay reduces our participation and they refuse to focus on what I think is the biggest concern is that we have one of the lowest partition rates, participation right. rates in the country. And that's right. where we should be focusing our energy. We do not have a problem with fraud. We do not have a problem with too many people voting. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to have you all just give us some information on um, some of your bills or some bills that you are seeing that might be positive or might not be positive that are coming through your um, either the House or Senate. We'll start with uh, Representative Blancet. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate that. So a couple of different things. 
One, since we kind of spent a good deal of time on, on um, education, one of the things that I have been pushing for for a number of years is to increase the student counselor ratio. There is an even greater need for counselors in our schools today, given the student population that we've got in our public education system and the need for um, uh, mental health support, et cetera. So um, I have been trying to get a minimum student uh, counselor ratio of 250 to one. So 250 students to one counselor, which is the national, the nationally recommended ratio. Um, the, um, the, the pushback on that has been one, we don't have the counselor workforce Two, and there's, there's just no money in the system to provide that. And my pushback has been, we can't afford to not have a better student counselor ratio because our student population needs assistance. And our teachers are put in such a position that they can't do it all. They cannot teach um, and they cannot um, pull together and be counselors at the same time. It's just not humanly possible. And we're putting too much on our teachers right now. And so one thing that I have done is um, I did have a bill. It did not make it to the floor um, because of a technicality that um, the floor leader on the majority side um, did not want to address. So he promised me in negotiation that he would take a Senate bill that comes over, uh, get the Senate bill, put the language of my bill into it, and what the the new uh, amended language would require is that it, it would um, enable the State Department of Education to put $10 million in appropriations that we would provide them into a grant fund that school districts could then apply to um, use that money to hire additional counselors. And so I was able to negotiate an additional $10 million to put toward counselors where it's needed. Now, we'll see if the floor leader is, is, um, follows um, uh, on his promise and makes good with putting that into a Senate bill that we'll be able to hear. So um, keep an eye out for that um, and fingers crossed that that hits the floor next week. So we will see on that. Uh, I remember hearing you uh, present the bill in committee and some of those questions just were astounding. It's like, what is going on here? I mean, really, really, you know, and, and um, I mean, I agreed in the committee meeting, you know, in response to the questions, I, I agreed, let's take the title off. Let's all come together at the table. Let's talk. I mean, the bottom line is, our students need more counselors. They need academic counselors. They need licensed professional counselors. They need access to these resources. And it is irresponsible for us not to provide them, given what we know about today's student population. Um, and, and so I was like, OK, if it's not 250 to 1, then what is the acceptable ratio? We know we don't have enough today. So let's. how can we come together? This. Debbie, this is what governing is about. This is, we, you know, we have a responsibility to govern. We have a responsibility to listen and come together and work together to put out policies and resources that work for our citizens. We're, our job is not to tow a party line. And so that is the, really the circumstance that we are having to deal with is a lack of desire to work together in a manner that benefits our citizens, regardless of what their political party is. And so my fingers crossed that I'm working with Representative Baker, who was the chairman of the education committee that supported it, working with Representative Tammy West that supported it, working with uh, Representative Mark McBride that supported it. And we also got um, Senator Pemberton on the Senate side to say, yes, I would support an additional $10 million. So we've got all this Republican support. Let's just see if uh, Leader Eccles will listen to his own party and put that out there. Good. Okay. Thank you. 
uh, Representative Ransom. Well, you know, I love hearing Blancette speak so passionately about this because it is absolutely true. We do need more counselors in the schools. And I think what I'm looking at is um, the idea of the community schools. So Representative West, Tammy West, has a community school pilot program bill that is she's putting forward. And the, the whole idea of the community school the Democratic educator legislators have been talking about for some time where it's the school is the hub, you know, and the, the teachers are teaching the children and that is their focus. Then you have the counselors from mental health there. You have uh, physicians and nurses from regular health. Uh, you have parent classes in the evenings, you know, you have the, the nutrition and all of these things are, are handled by others so that our teachers can really focus on the education of children. And so that bill has passed through and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing hopefully that get, getting passed because I think we could really see some, a, a change in view of how we view our schools. And it is a bipartisan idea. I think we, we want the, our schools to be better. We want the teachers to not have as much pressure. We want students to excel. All of those things we want, and it doesn't matter about party. Very good, yes. Uh, there is a community school in uh, the Tulsa area, isn't there, Representative Blancet? Yes, um, yes. and in fact, um, if Melissa Provenzano were, were on the, uh, the, the call today, she could tell you all about the incredible things that she saw when she visited that school recently. And we are super excited to hear more about that. I think that um, Representative Ransom is correct that pr providing wrap around services in a central location that is in the neighborhood is connected to the neighborhood. You know, uh, according to um, Representative Provenzano, the parents are enga more engaged because they're in and out of the school for other services. And so for us to create this community centered approach to community wellness, and really that's what it is. It's education, it's working with families, it's engaging parents. It brings community wellness to the focus. And I think that that is a win-win. And quite frankly, as um, Representative Pro Provenzano has so eloquently said, this is our answer to the voucher pushback, mm -hmm. is getting community schools in place. And that's what we really need to be pushing for, is a community-centered model that brings in families and focuses on the community betterment, using schools and education as the center. Good. Great. Uh, uh, Senator Kurt, what are some of your bills? Well, so uh, I don't talk about bills as much because I, I have so much less control, but um, I'm, I, I'm very proud of the work we're doing with the Legislative Mental Health Caucus. Um, the, it's a bipartisan, bicameral group, just started last year, and um, we've prioritized this year a focus on um, youth suicide. We have a significant increase in the number of stu students facing uh, mental health crisis and facing suicide. Um, and then also on the workforce shortage in behavioral health. So there's a real shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, LPCs, peer recovery specialists, and social workers. And uh, uh, we've spent a lot of effort as a state to improve our primary care workforce, but we need to also uh, emphasize these healthcare care workers. Um, you know, th that group has worked hard to coordinate and try to be more um, help each other uh, and make sure that we're trying to focus on the things that can have the biggest impact. I'm most proud this month of we're starting to work on American Rescue Plan funding for behavioral health needs. And so I've been looking just this week, we're trying to fine tune which uh, will be the first proposals to get funding from the American Rescue Plan money that we got from the federal government. Oklahoma has $1.87 billion to spend. Um, there was an open call for applications. And so there's a wide variety of proposals, um, but we're looking at everything from state agency needs to um, nonprofits and community needs that that might really transform uh, mental health in our state. You know, a huge infusion of cash is a really good thing for getting over a mountain. So um, that's what I'm feeling hopeful about this week. Okay, uh, Senator Young, 
what are some of your issues? Yeah, well, obviously, I, I would, let me take a detour first because I'm going to come back to criminal uh, justice reform, but really I call it criminal legal reform. So <laughs> let me go. But the other thing, I had several bills that were not heard in, in committee, so they didn't, they didn't get out of committee. It was a racial impact statement, a bill that I've been trying to run for several years that would have looked at looked at every piece of legislation that would have been uh, approved by committee that would have uh, uh, elongated created new sentences and how they would impact certain communities. And, and part of the problem with that is, if you look at the Department of Corrections, every time I call them, they give me the same statistic, is that you have uh, African-Americans, for example, make up eight, nine percent, eight percent, not nine, eight, seven to eight percent of the total state population. But we make up anywhere from 35, from 25 to 35 percent of the incarcerated population. There's something wrong with that particular statistic. Black folk ain't that bad. So we've got to look at the legislation that we're putting forth that may be creating problems in our justice system. The other one is a uh, bill to create a committee, a commission on race and equity, a, a place, a milieu where people could bring the concerns that impact them that they have run into, not only with law enforcement, and there's a ton of those with law enforcement, but with DHS, with Department of Corrections, any other entity that they feel like there are racial overtones or undertones, we have a problem with race and we don't want to talk about it. And so that commission, I believe, would have been very, very helpful if they had had heard it. But, but getting back to... Uh, Getting back to the Oklahoma Department of, uh, um, uh, going back to the mental health, as, as my cohort, uh, Senator Kurt talked about, listen, uh, we're going to have some very serious problems in my mind, and not just in my community, but I think across this state, across this nation, uh, as we as we, we're not coming out of it, but as we go through a lessening of the impact of COVID, there are some, some mental health issues that are coming to the surface already. You take that, and for my community, the, the problems of what has occurred, starting with George Floyd, and you just walk down the line to all those other incidents, you're going to have uh, people who have created within their psyches because of the thing. And, and you take the war in Ukraine. Listen, people are seeing that on TV every day. <laughs> You're looking at bodies in the street. That is unnatural. That is not common. That is something that's impacting each and every one of us. Imagine what that's doing to our children who are, who are trying to get an education. And we've heard the problems with that already on this call. But but we're going to have to do something with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services are going to have. I, and I appreciate them. I called and uh, they provided some additional funds for a couple of entity agencies in my neighborhood because of what was happening to uh, African-American males in particular. That is going to be an issue that we're going to have to address on top of all of these other issues that we're talking about. And, and lastly, I said to come back to it, I did mention some criminal justice reform stuff. I'm, I'm on the Oklahoma, Oklahoma's for criminal justice reform. I want to change the name. I don't think our system is just. I think we ought to call it the Oklahoma criminal legal system because it is not just. And we've got so much work to do. And part of that work has to do with a lot of the things that we've discussed today. And as I listen to Representative, I mean, Sister Trish and Sister Melody, both of them uh, work with them. Listen, education is, education is the foundation. If you, if you don't realize that, uh, we're going to continue to have these overwhelming yes. problems yes. that springboard out to all the other areas in our lives. <laughs> Uh, back to that, I, I wish we could have some legislation. I did, uh, Senator Taylor has a bill that came across and I think uh, 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 Minority Leader exec, uh, Elect Munson was the, was the author in the House uh, to look at uh, second chances for people who are working through problems. And then Senator Thompson has a bill that looks at fines and fees, which is a very significant issue that we, we got folk, they said we don't, but we have folk in county jail, Oklahoma City County Jail, Oklahoma County Jail that are there because they couldn't pay fees and fines. You can't put folk in jail for being poor. And, and that's part of it. So I hope that bill gets some legs and gets through and uh, the uh, one second chance bill, because I think those are very important bills that will help us to be able uh, to make some progress. Hey, Debbie, yes. I'm, can I add something just real quick? Yes. Oh, yeah. With, with regard to and amen, Brother Young. Um, uh, with regard to the criminal justice reform, one of the things that I just wanted to let you know that I'm working on, we, um, and I've been working on this for about six, six months now on this particular effort, effort. Um, so one of the things that we've 
that we've got to try to do is to get data on our incarceration rates. Right now, I mean, there have been a number of things over the years that have given us kind of an overview of who's in jail, what are they in for, you know, and some, some basic demographic information, but it is not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. And today, if you were to ask how many people are in our jails, how long have they been there? How did they get there? Um, are they in there for fines and fines and fees? Um, did they plea out? All, all of this data, we have no statewide data at all today to answer those questions. So, you know, my pushback has been, how can you possibly push policy? How can you possibly push policy until we have a better understanding of what we're dealing with right now? And so, you know, we know that the state two state questions passed 780 and 791. We know that no money went into 791. And so in order to make responsible decisions about where the investments can be made and what policy changes, um, we've got to have data. Nobody collects it right now. So I reached out uh, as a result of, of an interim study this last summer that I did um, to the Pew Charitable Trust that put me in, in connection to the Crime and Justice Institute. So we've been working over the last six months. Uh, they have uh, gotten approval of their national board and their funders to, if we get an invitation directly from the governor, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate pro tem, they will come to Oklahoma, work with about 15 representative county jail administrators to do queries and set and pull that data for us, analyze it, and then feed it back in terms of normalized, aggregated data for responsible decision making. This would be, not be at Oklahoma's cost. This would be at their cost. It would, it's like an 18-month project. We're in the process right now of getting um, various stakeholder approvals. We've been meeting with the Sheriff's Association. We've been meeting with um, law enforcement related legislators. We've been meeting with the governor's office. We've been meeting with the Speaker of the House. We've been meeting with senators. And um, I, in terms of our, prob our probability of success, I would estimate that we're probably 65% maybe of the way there to get to getting this resource. They would start working this summer if we can get this beyond um, approval. They're coming, the they're bringing teams back uh, the week of April the 18th to do additional due diligence. So fingers crossed, everyone, that we get this resource put in place. Oh, that's fantastic news. Yes, that would be really helpful for our state. Um, just to let you know, I've kind of been out on the doors uh, campaigning for a candidate and this candidate has been really uh, supportive of the mental health issues. And when I would bring that up on the doors, the people would be so positively responsive. Uh, so I, there are lots of people that really know that this is a concern. So, okay. Um, is there any other Debbie, can, can, I jump in, can I jump in for just a moment? Yes. I yes. want to go back. One of the questions came, what can we do about the deaths in the county jail? But back to what Representative Blancet was talking about right then, also about the, the uh, statistics. There's a couple of things that, uh, one, you know, I don't I don't want to quote a number because it's not coming to me right now, but I know it's like 14 or 1,500 people who are currently incarcerated in the Oklahoma County Jail. The, the first thing that jumps out, I'm on a phone call about once every two, three weeks with a group from across the nation that's talking about, one, voting in jail. M many of those folk have not been convicted of any crime, and they legally have the right to vote. We're having difficulty getting the county jail to help us to uh, get those folk not to register. M many of them are registered. That There's just no pathway for them to vote while they're in jail. And I can tell you because it's Oklahoma City and because of who the police normally uh, arrest, uh, some of them could be the difference in my getting elected or not. So I'm very serious about getting those folk, uh, their votes out. The other thing is this, this the whole thing, and, and I, don't, I know we don't have time to get into it, but the question about what can we do about the deaths in county jail, 
obviously we have problems with the system, with the structure. Uh, this administrator, I, I think it's still a good deal. Maybe it's the wrong person. Maybe it's the wrong people. But we, we really do need to take, and I hope Oklahoma County and the county commissioners will look at it and involve a larger group of folk to look at what's the best way to, to deal with it. And part of it is that county jail. And I know it's an issue that we don't want to get into now. We need a new physical structure. That structure will not work. I worked on the second commission that Willa Johnson, Commissioner Willa Johnson appointed me to. And this was 20 years ago. And we still got the same jail. We knew when it was built, it was not effective. Go up in Tulsa County. They have a wonderful facility up there and it can work. But I want to quickly add that 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 those two things about uh, the county jail, people who are in there who can't vote. And then we have a problem, not only just with the administration of that jail, but part of the problem with the deaths in that jail is the way that that jail is administered. So we need to look at that. So I want to just say that. I didn't mean to interrupt you, though. Oh, so that's, that's important, very important. That's just amazing. People are registered to vote, but they don't have the facilities to do it. It's, well, the and other you thing- them. And you can always, register them to vote while they're in jail too. It's, there, there's no yeah. law against that, so yeah. All right. Well, and the point that I was gonna make here is that it, we don't know how many people are, are in county jails that are pre-trial. Pre-trial means they have not been convicted. That doesn't mean they're guilty. Just because they're in jail, jail does not mean they're guilty. Pre-trial incarceration is out of control. Right. Yeah. And then they keep then they rack up a debt, and mm -hmm. then they have to pay that off. I mean, and that's just it. And they're not even guilty. Exactly. All right. Okay, so do you have any closing words, uh, Senator Kurt? I'll hop in there. I just wanted to encourage everyone. Um, advocacy from the folks following this is so important. And even if you feel like your senator or representative agrees with you or disagrees with you all the time, it's still worth speaking up. Even if you agree with the stances we take, it helps us to have the stories I love being able to tell my colleagues I've been contacted by this, by so many people about this. So it's not like I'm just speaking on my own because I'm the only one who cares about it. I can show that I'm truly representing my, the people. It does matter for you to speak up. And I know it can be disheartening. Um, there are weeks where it's very hard to deal with what has, has come through. But, you know, like today I got to go speak to a group of high school students at Northwest Classen in Oklahoma City Public Schools. They're taking part in Generation Citizen and they are learning to change the world. And I got to say, that just gives me the hope that as we involve and get people active, um, they're seeing the world in a new way and they see the world in terms of what resources are out there and what's available. They were working on a project to help their fellow students. You know, it was all about how they could help their own. It was actually, you know, pre-criminal justice. It's all about disciplinary issues and they want to try to change the way discipline works around vaping and they don't think it's right that kids just get kicked out of school and nothing changes and i just thought they're just prepping for helping us change the criminal system as well and i felt so inspired today and hopeful that we can engage the next generation and and absolutely make change okay thank you that's a great program it uh, is a great program i've yes. i've spoken at putnam city north at a class up there that for generation citizen and just the ideas that young people come come up with and it's it's so important because you know not only do we have a republican democratic divide rural urban divide we have an age group divide yes and the more that we can incorporate voices of the present generation this is the most inclusive generation we have ever seen yes. if we can incorporate them so much more could be done to make the uh, state a better place for them, that they will want to stay. I mean, I think that's another thing. We have too many legislators who who legislate on the way life used to be when they were young. or And so we're not addressing uh, the world that is and the world that will be. And that is something that we really need to do. So, so going that advocacy route, be, speaking up, doing what you can to advocate for what you firmly believe, but then taking the next step, which is vote. We have to be an active voting population. And um, the apathy party has, you know, 
it is alluring because, you know, oh, what does my vote matter? Your vote matters. It matters. And so we have to really make sure that we say no to the apathy party. Definitely. Yeah. And it's even in the school board election this week, those, some of those races were so close. So, um, Representative Blancet, you have closing words? Uh, closing words. And I, I just want to agree with both uh, Representative Ransom and, and Senator Kurt in terms of uh, legislative advocacy, even if um, you have a senator or a representative that you don't necessarily um, agree with, it's, a, it's really important for you to email them and to call their office and to let them know what your feelings are, because that is, that is really important. The other thing, too, is um, I, I'm just speaking for myself. Um, I would I know that um, I would love to appear and talk with neighborhood associations. So if any of you are involved in neighborhood associations in your particular area, bring, invite your senator, invite your uh, representative to come and talk about their legislative priorities. And I think that that's a great way to get people more involved and engaged um, in what's going on at their state legislature. Very good. Yes, definitely. Uh, senator Young. Uh, yes, um, you know, I, I was listening to that, and and, and uh, particularly when we got into the advocacy part, uh, many of you probably know that I'm back in the pulpit again as an interim pastor. And I tell you, it is one of the most uh, rewarding things from the standpoint that obviously they know that during the week I'm in the struggle up at 23rd and Lincoln, and we visit other churches and other churches visit us. And over the last year and a half that I've been back in the pulpit, it has, it has been extremely helpful on a daily basis to hear the concerns of those people who have who are engaged in life on a level that shows the very impact of what we do at 23rd and Lincoln. It has been extremely helpful to me. It has given me a whole new insight, better than even when I knocked on doors. They have an outlet to, to speak to me about the things that have, have bothered them, that have changed them. And, and out of that, what they want to come to is that, listen, I, even though I'm frustrated a lot of times Monday through Thursday at being at 23rd in Lincoln, I am I am encouraged by the remarks and the responses of people that I run into because of my work as a pastor, because they know I'm a senator and because they want to have some voice in what's going on. I am encouraged that people are involved and they are trying their best to understand what's going on. And that has encouraged me. And, and we're still talking about young people. You know, that's a whole nother area. Young people are more involved than I think we really realize. And those who are not even voting, I've talked to my pages the last two or three weeks from Star Spencer. Those young people are well aware of what's going on. We're not pulling the wool over their eyes. They <coughs> know what's going on. They see the result of not funding education the way it should. And they were able to speak those things to me. And so, you know, I know it's tough. I know it's difficult for us, this group that's on this call uh, right now. But I would say to you, be encouraged, be strengthened. There is a movement afoot that we may not see it yet or feel it fully yet, but there is a movement afoot that I think is carrying us to places that we want to go, and maybe not in my lifetime, but I think it's going to happen. So I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by where we are. Good. Thank you. We're ending on a very positive note. And I just like to say thank you all for being with us today. Thank you for your hard work. Um, I've seen you on the floor debating. And uh, even though we're the minority party, we're the loud party too. You speak your truth, truth to power. And thank you all so much uh, for being there and enduring every day. <laughs> and so remember that Oklahoma Federal Democrat Women, uh, China, who is so, uh, uh, if you need to call us and you need a little pep talk, we're here for you. And we'll try to just do it ourselves. I'd like to thank my county chair, Robbie White, who helped me today. And I appreciate her making sure we got on the call. 
Uh, the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women will have their state convention virtually tomorrow, Saturday. So there's still time to register. Go to our OFDW Facebook page and check us out. We will have some candidates. Our statewide candidates have been invited. Uh, Kendra Horn will be there. Uh, Jenna Nelson and Madison Horn are the ones I know of that have confirmed. So we hope to have some more statewide on the call. And uh, best of luck to you all in your races. Thank you all for stepping up again. And I guess we'll see you Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday uh, at filing time. So thank you very much.